Well, I'm excited to finally be able to release content for my new YouTube channel, Truth Trauma Theology, and this is something that I wanted to release months ago. Uh, but as you could probably relate, there's been a lot of delays. And in my practice as a clinician, I've wanted to also make sure that I take good care of my clients through this time. And my wife and I have a beautiful baby boy that we've uh, been raising that, I, as you could imagine, we have our hands full. I'm really excited about this intersect between theology and psychology, and specifically the intersect between trauma and theology. Psychology and theology have been studied out to some extent, but the new frontier where there's just very little research is trauma and theology. And that's what I'm excited about. On the psychological side, I'm a licensed independent mental health practitioner who's also licensed as a marriage and family therapist. I work in private practice, primarily with trauma and complex trauma. On the theological side, I'm currently enrolled in seminary, pursuing my master's of divinity. And the goal prayerfully, is that I will be able to at some point do research at the next level with that intersect between trauma and theology. But before we get into the overview, I want to address a couple of concerns. The first concern is that the Word of God is being replaced by counseling theories and techniques. And I think there is validity to that. At some point, I would like to talk about where something like Jay Adams and Nuthetic counseling comes in, you know, Nutheteo, which is kind of that competent to counsel. I'd love to get to that. I can't wait to get to that. We're not going to get to that today, but it's a valid concern. And I wanted to acknowledge that before we get started. Again, this video is going to be focused on the biological effects of trauma. A second concern, and there, there are many, is that discipling or discipleship relationships are being replaced by counseling relationships. And I've actually expressed some of those concerns myself. I get it. I understand it. And I cannot wait to do a video on that. But that video is not today. Uh, others of us, maybe we have concerns about how certain mental health issues, certain mental health diagnoses have been over-spiritualized. I can't wait to do a video on that because I think that needs to also be done as well. We're not going to be doing that today. Again, we're focusing on the biological side and the bio biological effects of trauma. And I just want to say, in my practice, I see the atheist all the way to the pastor. And underneath that is this underlying core issue of trauma that needs to be treated. And, it, and there's a specialized approach we have to take in doing that. And that's something I make absolutely no apologies for. And then lastly, it's not just the experience, it's the message. You know, someone's betrayed. It's not just the loneliness. It's not just the shock. It's the utter, I have no idea who I am. Maybe there's a trauma that's happened and it has stripped you of your identity. You didn't, you thought the world worked one way and then something happens and it feels like a completely different world and you feel like a completely different person. What I first want to do is I just want to actually give us a simple understanding of trauma so that as we add the layers of complexity or we add the layers of depth, it's just a little bit easier to understand. It's kind of like when you have a closet and you have coat hangers in your closet. That's all I want to do is I, I want to organize the closet, so to speak, but we have to start with some coat hangers. So here's the best way to think about trauma that I think really works well for a lot of people. When we go through something, our brain wants to create a beginning, middle, and an end to everything that we experience. What trauma does is it makes it so that we have the beginning and we have the middle, but we don't have the end. We don't have that conclusion. We don't have that resolution. And where our brain is not able to create resolution, it oftentimes will create a reflex. That reflex becomes overdeveloped and, and as we go through life, it's not really necessary anymore. The problem is, is that if our brain hasn't been able to create that, it's gonna create it one way or the other. But the way the brain wants to store information, and this is very important, this idea of storing information, is it wants to create a beginning, middle, and an end, and oftentimes is able to do that. This is why for a lot of people, they don't think that they've received trauma, because for most things in their life, they're able to move through those stages very easily. However, there are things that happen in our lives that we think have conclusion, but they don't. They just have a reflex. And that's the issue is how reflex has your brain become around a certain incident or a certain trigger. And once our brain gets that conclusion, then all of a sudden we notice that the brain and the body calm down and we feel better. And that that's not a trigger for us anymore. Now what I want to do is I want to look at the official definitions of trauma. 
What I'm gonna do is start with the DSM-5. It's the most authoritative, it's the official definition of trauma. And the DSM is a statistical manual that's used to diagnose mental health disorders. You've likely heard of it before. The DSM-5 defines trauma as exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence involving direct exposure, witnessing in person, or indirectly. I think this definition is a great starting place. I probably would add to it simply because as we continue to study trauma, we notice that there are other things that are involved instead of just this definition. I think it's a bit narrow. I like the expanded definition that comes from trauma, meaning, and spirituality. It says that trauma is also suggested to include threats to psychological integrity, including major losses, events that were very upsetting but did not include fear of death or injury and early and severe childhood neglect. I like how that is specific. I think trauma is one of those things to where if you have just, if you have a narrow definition, again, you're gonna miss a lot of people, but when you expand it and you add specificity, now people can relate to it a little bit better. I think the thing that the expanded definition adds that I really like is that it, it can be something that threatens my psychological stability. That is something I've seen in the field over and over and over. And also you have the early and severe childhood neglect. That cannot be underscored enough. That idea of what happens in our kidhood really has a profound effect. The ACE study that was conducted years ago has been incredibly helpful and confirming when it comes to the effects of trauma. And then you have complex trauma. Complex trauma, there's a lot of variation in terms of definition for complex trauma. The way I like to think about complex trauma is sort of like complex grief. When you have more than one trauma that's involved and it gets added to a trauma that was already there, that now becomes complex trauma. And in treating that, I have noticed that it, it, it does create, it is more difficult. And if there's multiple traumas, you have to sequence them appropriately. And sometimes it just gets very tricky amidst this web of trauma of how to help someone get better because there's so much trauma that's affected and been stacked in onto their life. So complex trauma is when you're talking about multiple traumas. Then you have historical or intergenerational trauma. This is trauma that is very much affected to generations. So for example, when you think about the baby boomer generation, there was trauma that was passed down to them. Another generational example of trauma has to do with slavery. Do genes carry trauma? Do genes carry the effects of trauma? And are those transmitted to the next generation? I, I would say this, I think it's a great, I'd love to do a video on that. I think it's a great study. It's still extremely early when it comes to epigenetics. And so I think it's a worthy conversation, but this idea of historical trauma is absolutely a thing. Then you have the practical definition of trauma that I use in my practice, and I use it with people all the time. And it's a stored experience that disrupts a person's mental or spiritual resilience whether conscious or unconscious. And that's something that I think has just worked really well because again, going back to that stored experience, it can be an experience that has implications that we're not really aware of. I have a lot of people that I've treated, there are aspects of their trauma that they are not conscious of. Trauma can happen in utero, which means trauma in the womb or trauma can happen in a pre-verbal sense, which is before we have words. And then all of a sudden we have all these symptoms later. Next, I wanna look at some symptoms. I think what most people do, and I hope you're not doing this necessarily in looking at this video, is I hope you're not diagnosing yourself. Part of that is because I think many times in our society we get caught up in the labels and then we get labeled by the label. I think what I don't like about that is that we need to label the label. I don't like to talk labels, I like to talk symptoms. I'm gonna start with depression, right? And then you have irritability, decreased interest, numbing, decreased concentration, insomnia, so you can't sleep, overwhelming feelings and sensations, no sense of the future, feeling hopeless, no or unclear memories, intrusive memories, nightmares, flashbacks, you're gonna have night terrors. Night terrors are when you wake up and you can't remember what you were dreaming about, but you were essentially vapor locked, you're, you're freaking out. Then you have hypervigilance, mistrust, general anxiety, panic attacks, chronic pain, headaches. Again, the body keeps the score. There's a really great researcher we're gonna look at, Vanderkolk, who has really done a great job. He wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And I think it's extremely helpful in explaining trauma. And then you have feeling 
unreal or out of body, you have what we call derealization and depersonalization where you feel like you're out of your body or you don't feel like you're real. Self-destructive behavior, loss of sense of who I am, this idea of our identity gets shattered. Trauma is one of those things to where it can create all of these different issues, but underneath it is an, an, an event that has been stored maladaptively. It's been stored in a state that is unusable, that is dysfunctional for your brain and your body and your hormones and every aspect of who you are. It needs to be resolved. So what I'm gonna do now is I wanna talk about how the brain works. We're gonna go bottom up and then we're gonna go left to right, all right? So first of all, you have the triune brain, right? You have the three kind of layers of the brain. Van der Kolk in his book, The Body Keeps the Score. Also McLean, The Triune Brain. You have this idea that the brain has different functions and it has different regions that handle different things. You have the brainstem. This is the part of us that's autonomic, meaning this is the part of us that doesn't ask for permission. This is where the fight, flight, freeze, attach and submit instinctive responses uh, dwell. And these are the parts that if you see a dog foaming at the mouth, your brain doesn't stop and ask for permission. It just gets you out of this is about survival. Then you have the limbic system, which is where kind of the brain and the body connect, right? When I ask people what they're feeling, I actually don't ask them that way. The best way to deal with someone who has trauma is to ask them where they're feeling it in their body. And that gives you enormous information. It also creates some emotional intelligence for people because trauma is not one of those things that you can necessarily verbalize. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. And then you have the prefrontal cortex that we all know, right? That's what we use to think. That's what we use for executive planning and functioning to make good decisions, right? So the brain works bottom up, but it also works left to right, or I guess you could say right to left as well. Regardless, you have different parts of your brain that do different things. The left side of the brain is very analytical. It's the part of the brain that is gonna be more logical. And they have the right part of the brain that's gonna be more emotional or more feeling based. But what trauma does Trauma gets us to live in one part of our brain versus the other. When you think of the left part of the brain, it's the part of you that thinks. But what trauma does is it gets you to think and not be able to feel at the same time. That's a problem. Or trauma will affect you because now you can feel, but you can't think. And I find that oftentimes in many marriages, when I do couples counseling and so forth, you have one person who can think, but they can't feel. And another person who can feel, but they can't think. And it creates problems in the relationship. When even when you think about maybe your significant other, who's the thinker and who's the feeler. Either one is not a great place to live. What we want to do in order to resolve trauma is we want to get this handshake going on where in the brain can think and feel at the same time. We need this sort of friendly interaction happening in your brain. Here's the issue. Trauma stores everything in terms of intensity as well. If a person hasn't been prepped, if you've not resourced them appropriately, it's going to electrocute them and they're gonna what's called dissociate. And so there's a lot of prep that goes into helping people to resolve their trauma. It's not just a couple of sessions, we talk it through, we move it, and that's it. That's not the process. Unfortunately, a lot of people want that because they want relief, but you have to, and we're gonna talk about this later as well, you have to do state work before you do trait work. And I, I really, and I mean this, I want to help people to feel better. I want people to start living instead of reliving, but it, there is a process that people have to commit to. And there's different reasons why that's difficult for people to commit to. I have many folks that I have borrowed from and that I reference, but what I wanna do right now is I just wanna reference one that I, I think is very, very helpful because it, it takes what we've just learned and it actually puts it into practice. You know, it kind of applies it. You know, when you think of someone, when they go through trauma, we talked about the right brain is where the experience is, is housed, if you will. And then the left side of the brain is the logical part. Well, interesting, when you, when you look at an fMRI, right, this looks at what's happening in your brain as far as activity. When someone is in the reliving their trauma, you have the right side of the brain that, again, is where the experience is. But here's the other part. You have the visual cortex, which is responsible for replaying the images in our mind when you look at someone who's reliving under an F fMRI, what you find is that the right part of the brain is lit up, is very much activated, it's aroused, and the visual cortex is aroused. But here's what's interesting. Not only on the left side of the brain where you have logic, not only is that much less active, but specifically the Broca's area. The Broca's area is responsible for speech right? To explain what I've been through, right? Putting words to our experience. Now think about that for a moment. If what I'm going through is very much felt, 
and seen, but I'm not able to put words to it. Think about how that would affect how you could address it. So for example, I love talk therapy, I was trained to do it, but I was also trained very much to approach things from an experiential perspective. The last thing you want to do with someone who's been through incredible trauma is to try to engage the part of them that can't put words and is very much disconnected from the part of them that is having the experience. Again, trauma is not just about living, it's about reliving. And the parts of the brain that get activated when we're reliving are the same parts of the brain that overwhelm the logical part. In other words, to try to engage with someone when they're reliving is not gonna get you very far because they don't have words for what it is that they are experiencing. And that is not a very good avenue to help them re-experience safety. So you're gonna have a different approach, which is where I and many other clinicians have had to really get special training and helping people to move forward. What I wanna do now is I wanna look at how trauma affects a developing mind. Oftentimes what you'd like to do is you'd like to go back and you wanna see how trauma affects us through the developmental stages, going back from our kidhood. And when you look at when someone's a child, <clears throat> that's when you see a lot of trauma experience and then it just kind of compounds through time and then we see many, many issues later. So Janina Fisher has really good aids that really help to communicate <clears throat> in a very simple way how trauma affects, for instance, a child's developing mind. In one of her slides, she has a really good representation of a child whose mind develops in a safe, supportive world. And what she's kind of got is this idea of, you know, a supportive caregiver who's affirming, who's reassuring, who provides a secure attachment base. When things go wrong, they're there to help pick up the pieces. But what they also do is they help a child to co-regulate. But co-regulation is where you're attached to me and I'm helping you to regulate something that's unmanageable in you. And this is our job as secure attachment bases for our children is our job is to help them to discipline their disappointment. Oftentimes as parents who, let's say we're not disciplining, we're not regulating ourselves very well, we now sort of onboard unconsciously our children to help regulate our emotions, which is particularly dysfunctional, but it's something we do very easily at times, not even realizing it. So ideally what happens is that you have a supportive, secure attachment base for a child. They're able to workshop those disappointments in life. And then what they're able to do is regulate that bottom part of the brain. You have the instinctive part of the brain that is very much reactionary, very impulsive based. That's able to be regulated. And you find that the child's functioning allows them to be resilient. And again, you need all parts of the brain. Again, we work from the bottom up. When you look at children's brain, it, when they're developing, the first thing in the womb to develop is the brainstem. That's the first thing. And as time goes on, we work with children as their brains are developing. And around 25, again, is when you find that that prefrontal cortex is, for the most part, developed. In a supportive, secure environment, a child is, there's a flexibility that you find. However, if that a secure attachment base is missing from a child and, and they don't have that in their environment, that child starts to miss developmental milestones. You know, our society, we do a pretty good job of assessing for intellectual milestones. We assess for social or athletic milestones. Here's what we struggle with often, is we struggle to monitor and to assess for emotional milestones. We assess for emotional milestones in other ways but we don't assess for them directly very well. And part of that is just the society that we live in, uh, Western dominant culture pathologizes dependence. So we don't, we'd actually set people up very well to be securely attached to people because kind of that a meritocracy, that idea of the pull yourself up by your bootstraps, the rugged individualism really coaches co-regulation out of people. And it's really, really unfortunate very damaging, and it keeps people immature, stuck, lonely, isolated for a significant period of their life unless they get help. So going back to the idea of if a child is missing those developmental milestones, we catch them because they have symptoms in other areas. Here's the issue is if it doesn't get caught early, you're going to catch it later. And as an adult, we have to go back and do developmental repair. We have to go back and repair a person where at a very fundamental core attachment level, they may need the, the basics. And, and this is unfortunate because most times as we get older, the expectations elevate. 
right? You get less grace for not being up to speed the older you get. People have higher expectations for adults. And in many, for a lot of situations, for a lot of adults, they didn't get those needs met when they should have got them met by the people they should have got them met by. And, and it's kind of lingered. So it's very important that we really set up children for that developmental process to occur uh, in a way that helps them be resilient. So along with affecting a child's development and that when we become adults, we, we don't have those tools, we don't have those skills to regulate our anxiety, we, we see that that, can, that starts as a child, right? We see that it starts when we're supposed to be hitting those milestones. That doesn't happen as adults. We're not able to control. We're not able to feel and deal. The automatic activation model is something that Janina Fisher references in her work that I've used as well. And it's this idea of tolerance, right? Distress tolerance, my window of tolerance, my ability to think and feel at the same time. And the goal again, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the very similar words, uh, hopefully it keeps it consistent, is the goal is integration for me to be able to think and feel at the same time. People can, that can think and feel at the same time, they are able to put into motion and deploy both parts of their brain to have the full human experience. Trauma disrupts that. And what trauma does is it makes it so that our window of tolerance is very, very narrow. And it can be narrow around different things. For instance, you can wake up on the wrong side of the bed, or you can get hangry, or you can get halted, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. A lot of things can put your window of tolerance at a very narrow uh, position. However, trauma is what creates that narrowing. So around a specific situation, I can have a very narrow window of tolerance based off of what I've been through. And so what happens is, is maybe in many areas of my life, and this is where I think trauma is very mystifying for people, because in many areas of their life, they have a, their bandwidth is pretty, pretty, pretty wide, and they can handle a lot of things, and their resilience is pretty solid. But there are a few key areas that kick them into these impulse states, where they do this like flee, or they do this fight, or they do this freeze, and that's as a result of there's an area where the brain is sort of out of its range, right? It, it just, it's tightly calibrated. It's very, very narrow. And so what happens is, is when we have a small window of tolerance, a very narrow window of tolerance, we go into hyper arousal or we go into hypo arousal, right? So if I can't stay in this window, I'm gonna get really, really, really on edge or I'm gonna get numb, I'm gonna start shutting down. And here's the thing, we're dealing with the part of the brain that doesn't ask for permission. Our brain isn't just good at surviving physically, it's also good and adept at surviving emotionally. So when someone's going through something overwhelming, even as children, you know, one of the most heartbreaking things is when a child is going through abuse. For those of us that treat children who had, who've experienced association in their kidhood, what you end up finding out is there are large pockets of their kidhood that they can't remember. The brain for them kind of, it's kind of like a, uh, 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 it's sort of like a fuse box, right? If there's too much current going on, the whole box shuts down. And that's, there's like a circuit breaker aspect to our brain. And as children, there's just memory loss. They, they go into a state where their brain protects them. And it's really sad, but then there's this piece where the brain is doing its job. Unfortunately, later in life, when our circumstances are different, we then aren't able to, connect. we're not able to shut it off. We're not able to stay where we can think and feel at the same time and that creates dysfunction. So what we gotta do is we gotta grow that window of tolerance. The way to do that is through that idea of integrating, right? To get the brain to do a handshake, to get people regulating their emotions. I'm gonna throw my clients when I'm seeing them, I'm throwing them a life preserver. I'm not getting in the water. I'm not necessarily the one who's going and saving them. That's, that's, that's not helpful. What's helpful is to help people to swim. What's helpful is to help people to co-regulate. I am a secure attachment base, but what I do is I help them learn how to regulate. They mirror what I'm doing. Maybe something I'm doing is helping to guide them in a process that's helping their brain and their body de-arouse. We have to expand someone's window of tolerance and then we can get into changing how that event is stored in their brain. Again, if you don't increase someone's window of tolerance, they're gonna dissociate. They're gonna go into hyperarousal 
or they're going to go into hypoarousal really, really quickly. So we got to increase that. And once we get it increased, then we can start working on how it's stored. We can work on where in the psyche, where in the body, this is an important part, where in the body that that trauma has sort of stored itself. And you can see it all the time, right? So when I process with people and we do the experiential part where we're not doing the talk therapy, we're doing something like EMDR, or I'm just, we're dropping into a meditative state where the brain is really, really kind of uh, integrated and there's this integrative process happening. Uh, people oftentimes, if you direct them to their bodies, there's this amazing process that starts to happen where their brain and their body starts to sync up. They're able to locate that and they're able to have a process that allows them to reprocess it and it starts to move, it starts to shift. It doesn't always shift, especially with complex trauma. We've talked about this a little bit at the beginning of the video, whereas complex trauma is going to make it so maybe there's layers to allowing a person to expand their window of tolerance and then finally reprocess it. It's stored differently and now it's not something that triggers a person because their brain and their body are thinking, they're clicking at the same time, they're, both sides of their brain are working at the same time to store it in a, in a way that's not going to arouse them when that trigger happened. A couple quick things before I close out the video. I wanna talk through how our brain stores the messages. So what our brain does is it stores our trauma through our five senses. This is why a rape victim can tell you what, let's say, the perpetrator that was perpetrating on them was wearing. They can tell you uh, in terms of, let's say, a scented fragrance. They can tell you what this person was wearing in terms of, let's say, a red shirt. They can tell you if there's music playing in the background. The way that it stores inside the psyche is very much that it recreates an experience that doesn't allow the brain to know how much of it is in the present, how much of them is in the present versus the past. That's that time disorientation. Uh, Melissa Abuelio, she's a, a great friend and also therapist that I know who also does great work with trauma. The way that she kind of talked about it, that I like the way she framed it. Trauma needs to be time stamped. In other words, your ability to know where you are, but more importantly, when you are, it gets disturbed, that gets disrupted. And part of it is because of how trauma stores. Vanderkoek does a great job talking about the timekeeper, how the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is what helps to create that sense of when I am, not just where I am, but when I am. When that goes offline, and we know that when trauma is happening, the part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, but also the part of the brain that's logical, that shuts down, that goes offline. This person's at a very big disadvantage in terms of knowing where they are, but also when they are. So you have the experience aspect of it. And again, what does it take to create a re our reality? It takes our five senses. And that's what gets hijacked in during a trauma reliving moment. When, you live, when you're in trauma, we call it trauma time. When you're in that moment, you don't know when you are. You have the experience of the trauma, but what's equally debilitating is the message, right? When you think about something that's been overwhelming that's happened, there's a profound message that goes along with that that makes a person feel very much out of their depth. They don't know what to do with that message. It's overwhelming. And it's bigger than just the, the verbal part of it or the logical part about it. It's something that actually feels true in their body. And that has to be confronted and we have to look at how it's stored. So we gotta be very mindful. You gotta be very strategic when you're dealing with trauma. Trauma is very chaotic. Trauma is about taking something and denaturing it. Taking something and creating complete chaos within someone's soul. And it's trauma is the opposite of restorative. What we want to bring is we want to bring balance. We want to bring safety. We want to bring realistic. And this is very important. A positive cognition is an unrealistic. The brain is smart enough to know reality to some extent. And I think for a lot of people, you know, when you think about some of these affirmations, some of those affirmations need to be checked. I'm all for, you know, real affirmations, but it's just important that we make sure that they are, uh, that they're, that they're within the scope of reality. For a lot of if they would if they would commit to a real regime where they put themselves in position where situations where they have to increase the ability to overcome discomfort with healthy coping skills that distress tolerance would increase they wouldn't go to hyper effective or hypo effective where they freak out or they check out if they would train more consistently and also more effectively and you have state work versus trait work. We're gonna talk about that in future videos, but again, that's that idea of people have to learn how to get in and out of their states 
before we can work with the trait within them, right? So if I'm gonna open, I'm gonna activate something within a person, it's not fair for me unless they can zip themselves back up. It's not just my job to help zip someone up. It's their job to also zip themselves up appropriately as well. And then lastly, if there's different levels of trauma, I'm not really expecting everybody to have this level 10 of trauma, but I would expect people to get in touch with the fact that they probably have come into more instances of trauma than maybe they've realized or even willing to admit. So the next video is really gonna be focused on trauma and recent events. We're gonna take what we're looking at today and we're gonna apply that to what we see happening in our society right now. We're gonna mainly focus on what we're seeing in the black community and law enforcement and the dominant group. We're, we're, that's that's gonna be the, folk, the, the primary focus, but we're also going to talk through, I'm gonna also talk a little bit about COVID and how COVID is affecting people's resilience. It's something we really need to be mindful of as far as COVID and trauma. And that's gonna be something that I don't really have as much time as I'm gonna want to study out. I look forward to hooking up with other people who are studying out some of those different aspects. I look forward to the next video. I'll see you then.